So hello and welcome everyone to this 257th episode of our little audio recordings here on the topic of cultivating the mind, practicing for meditation. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the two forces in our practice that are probably the most predominant forces. The one is cultivating and the other is releasing. Very often um, people are either too heavy on one side or the other. They might be heavy cultivators or they might be heavy releasers, if you want to call it like that. So um, a heavy cultivator, somebody that is too heavy on the side of cultivation is a doer, somebody that does a lot that wants to achieve a lot of results, that wants to push for it, that goes for it. It's like these kind of go, go get him mentality. While it has some very useful attributes, it's not useful if it becomes extreme. And the same is true for the other side, for a releaser. Um, that would be a person, if you are too heavy on that side, for example, then you would be a person that uh, relaxes too much, follows their preferences too much. Um, very often, actually, actually, true release doesn't mean to follow your preference. You let go of your preferences. But very often, people are too heavy on the side of release. They, they would be people who, um, what do you say, who kind of don't want to take responsibility and uh, for themselves or for anything else in the world, for their actions and so forth. So they kind of disguise their lack of wish to take responsibility um, as meditation. So they say, oh, just relax, you know, just let go. Meditation is all about letting go. It's not, it's not all about letting go. That's a... I think that's a wrong perception of meditation. Meditation should be a balanced endeavor. So it's it's partially about cultivating and building certain qualities, and on the other on the other end, it's about letting go. Now you could say the overall topic of the teachings of the path is one of letting go, but it's not that kind of letting go which is um, which is like being inactive or lazy or following your preferences, just do whatever you want. You see, and most people confuse that. They think that's letting go. If you if you just do whatever you want and you just let everything flow and you let the universe guide you and all these kind of conceptions that exist, right? But that's that's not really letting go. That's just very often not wanting to take responsibility for oneself. So on one side, you cultivate too heavy, usually you end up very stressed, you end up burnt out, the meditation gives you more headache than it gives you release and pleasure. Um, on the other end, when you're too released, too relaxed, too inactive, um, then of course, you know, the, the meditation won't yield any results, you won't get any further in your practice, you won't get any deeper. So it's really important that you have a nice balance between those two forces. And it maybe helps you to know that both of those aspects or facets of the path, they are actually conditioning one another. So letting go, releasing, conditions, cultivating, and cultivating conditions, the practice of letting go and releasing. So I want to talk a little bit more about how that works. When you cultivate, and you cultivate properly in a balanced way, then you make effort. You're building something, you're creating something. The mind is a creative force. It is a field of potentiality. So you can create from the mind. And it is very important to create skillfully. If you create skillfully, the result of your creation is happiness, well-being, health, all the good stuff. If you create unskillfully, though, then of course the, the result would be suffering, stress, 
tension, lack of health, uh, disease, and so forth. So the first thing we really need to learn on the path is actually to create skillfully. Creation doesn't only mean that you do things and you, you build things. It also very much means that you stop doing certain things. Both are part of creation. For example, if you stop uh, doing a certain action that harms yourself, let's say uh, you love to eat chips and every time you uh, eat chips you end up with a sore stomach and you have trouble the next day, then um, it would be a clever thing to stop eating eating chips and that is both it is actually an activity of letting go you have to release eating chips you have to stop it but at the same time it's an action because it doesn't come easy you love eating chips so you kind of have to convince yourself to stop eating them so here would be an example of kind of of both of letting go and as well of, of cultivating of building a skill building the skill of letting go actually of letting go what harms you, what disturbs you, etc. So, um, th that way, you see, both of these qualities are enhancing one another. You let go of eating chips, then uh, it's, it's a difficult task, so you have to cultivate the strength and the courage, you have to study up on, on the fact that uh, the chips are bad for you or something like that, and it causes, causes you trouble, you have to recollect that, you have to remember that, you have to foresee the future, well if I eat chips right now then it will lead to, um, to stomach ache the next day, so I better don't, and so you convince yourself that is an action, to stop doing that, then there is the actual moment of release. You have to drop your impulse of going to uh, the, the store and buying yourself a bag of chips. Or when you're in the store already, grabbing the bag of chips. That is, that there is a moment where you have to stop. But all that stopping comes from all the cultivation that precedes it. I hope that's I hope that's kind of clear now with this example of the back of chips. Stopping something is one, one point here, one thing. You release, you, you drop the activity. And that's a short moment really that is preceded by a whole lot of moments of clever thinking, of, of a skillful use of your mind and your thoughts, and directing your attention in very specific ways so that you kind of give yourself the permission to stop. So I would call that a, a predominant activity of cultivating. Because the predominant thing that you are doing there is the whole phase of preparation that precedes dropping the back of chips is, um, is a cultivating effort. You have to convince yourself. And you have to use logic. You have to learn how to think well. You have to foresee events. You see, I'm saying all that because a lot of people nowadays, they mistake meditation practice or a spiritual practice altogether um, as just simply be in the moment and uh, just, you know, let go of future and past. However, that is also correct, it is correct to a large extent, but it lacks the facet of cultivating. So these people very often, they, they don't get any deeper into their practice, they don't get the powerful insight and the powerful life-changing moments of their practice um, and the deeper states of meditation, they don't get there. They don't get there precisely for the reason because of the, the facet of cultivating uh, is, is lacking in their practice. So it's imbalanced. They're just like kind of going with the flow. So they will probably grab the, the chips, the back of chips, and then just be in the moment, kind of conveniently ignoring the fact that it will lead to pain and suffering the next day. So very often these people are using spiritual practice to yeah, to kind of stay in the role of a little child that doesn't have to take any responsibility. Like I just go for whatever I like. I love it. I love those bag of chips. 
I want to eat them now. You know, we only live once, this kind of idea. You know, I only live once. If this was my last day today, um, I would probably just buy a whole lot of bags of chips and lock myself in my room and uh, have a nice day, you know, like maybe take drugs, maybe do this, maybe do that, uh, like following my pleasures and my instincts and so forth. Actually, when you ask people that question, what would you do if this is your last day? Very often their answer will show what kind of, um, what kind of character they have or um, how they're wired. So some people, for example, they answer, well, if, if this was my last day, you know, just screw it. I would just, you know, have a massive party and get totally drunk and by the end of the day, um, just die peacefully in, 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 in this haze. Other people would say, oh, if, I, if this was my last day, I would want to spend it with other people that are important to me, like my family members or friends or so. And yet other people say, oh, if this was my last day, I would like hardcore, I would sit down and meditate the whole day. You know, there's all different kinds of answers that will come up and all these answers, they can show you something. Uh, for example, the person that, uh, that would go for, you know, um, if this is my last day, then I would do nothing. That clearly shows that this person is spending most of their lifetime but doing things that they don't like to do. So if it was their last day, they wouldn't do any of it. You see? Uh, they would just rather do nothing then. It means they're frustrated by their doing very often. You know, it kind of points to that. Because otherwise, you know, if your doing is so unfulfilling that you wouldn't do it um, in your last day, then doesn't that show that you're unhappy with your doing? Might that maybe be a signal for you to, to change, to actually cultivate your mind and your, your body in a different way so that it is more fulfilling to you? That it has long-term beneficial effects both for yourself and others around you, right? So all that uh, can show how we are wired. And a lot of people are wired in the way to avoid suffering, right? And would say most people are wired uh, that way. So we don't want to suffer. So we always use the comfortable way. We don't want to be uncomfortable. But very often that's exactly what the path demands of you. The path demands that you face your discomfort, that you're looking at it, clearly understanding it so that you can transcend it. That's the idea. It starts in the very beginning with um, our posture, the way we sit in meditation practice. The advice is very clear. Sit still. Don't move. Don't fidget around. And yes, there will be a lot of pain. And of course, all that, the prerequisite for that is that you're sitting properly, that you're sitting in a good posture so you're not harming yourself in the long term. So when you sit in the right posture, upright, relaxed, etc., all that, then uh, there will be pain with that. Your muscles are too weak to hold it. Um, you're not stretched enough. The body is not open enough. The body gives you information, actually. It says, I'm weak. I can't support myself. I need to build strength. Now, you could ignore that. And not do anything or you could use that as a clear um, gesture from your body motivating you to do some some more exercise in the right way that supports you to be able to sit still that's the idea or the original idea of yoga of the asanas of the the various postures that we practice they allow you to be still for a long time so you can cultivate to deeper levels and reach samadhi the pinnacle which is um, reached by cultivating the mind, not just, not just the body. The body only serves as an initial vessel for the mind so it can calm down enough. So here you're confronted with pain and you have to be confronted with that pain because it gives you the opportunity to learn to deal with it creatively and in better ways. But really most people don't want to feel that pain so they would fidget around and they would 
constantly move their body, you know, delaying their progress in meditation practice. So they don't go any deeper because they're constantly escaping what they don't want to feel. That prevents us from letting go properly, from, from going deeper. Letting go here does not mean escaping your pain. That Many people confuse escaping their pain with letting go of their pain. That's not correct. Letting go here means even though that there is pain, you're looking so deeply into it that it dissolves. That would be proper letting go. The result of properly letting go of, of physical pain is the end of pain. There is no more sensation of pain. We should truly let it go and not by changing your body, but by changing your mind, by directing your attention in various different ways that help you to let go to such, a, to such an extent. And of course, for most people, this is a process. It's a gradual approach that requires a lot of cultivation and a lot of letting go. So again, to come back to the original topic, cultivating and letting go, and cultivating and releasing. Cultivation is very much about actions, what you do, what you don't do, and their results, of course. So you determine whether an action is skillful or not by the result it, it creates. And one action doesn't just only create one result, of course, like one seed doesn't just create one tree or one plant. It has the potential for uh, an infinite amount of um, results that come from it. It's quite amazing actually if you contemplate that. So letting go now, releasing. This is the part in the practice where you have to stop doing, where you have to see clearly through things so that you can put them down. So the element of releasing, you find that in the practice, in the first stage, we are releasing tension in the body, right? So you need a bit of doing, you need to guide your mind. Uh, for example, you need to bring it back to the task at hand. And then you need to see the pain, see the tension and release it as you breathe out. So that you are able to become more comfortable. So on that first stage, that first level, the balance between letting go and releasing is like this. Oh, sorry, the balance between uh, acting or cultivating and letting go is like this. You're cultivating a body which is able to release larger and larger amounts of pain and discomfort, tension and so forth. Stress, right? So in order to be able to release stress in the body, tension in the body, you have to somehow shape your body and put it into the right shape so it can let go. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's, it's kind of like I have a bottle of water here in front of me, so uh, that might be a good example. It, it has a cap on it. So if I turn it around, you can hear that. That's the bottle of water. So if I turn that around, and now all the water is like pressing against the 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 tap oh how do you call it the, the cap sorry not the tap the cap so all the water is pressing downwards and if i would unscrew the cap all the water would fall out of the bottle so i'm not doing that right now um but that's kind of how it is we all have like little caps all over the body that prevents the energy from flowing downwards from releasing downwards from really relaxing properly so the action here would be to unscrew the cap and the letting go happens naturally as a result. That would be kind of an example <laughs> that, that comes to mind right now that describes this process a little bit, the mechanics of it. So you have to do something, unscrewing the cap, uh, so that your body can release naturally because your body naturally wants to release. It naturally wants to relax. The same, by the way, is true for your mind. And with the mind, we're working on the next stage now. A releasing the future and the past. So you're releasing um, a large amount of time. 
And you do that by releasing all thoughts about the future, all thoughts about the past. Then you end up in the present moment. You're more aware of what is happening right now. I think John Kabat-Zinn defines mindfulness as knowing what is happening while it is happening without judgment, I think, something like that. Now, that would be this first stage. Okay, so we are here knowing what is happening, knowing what is going on. Like when you feel something, you know that there is a feeling right now and it wanders through the body. Uh, when you're breathing, you know that you're breathing. The breath goes in and out. When you hear a sound, you know that you're hearing a sound. Like that, you're aware of where your attention is right now. Again, for that to work, you have to cultivate your mind. You have to bring it back into the present moment by releasing future and past. So again, there is a balance of activity, of action, directing your mind properly. And then there is a moment of letting go, finding the present moment again. So I wonder, if, when you sit down and do your practice, actually if you are able to find this kind of, these both facets at work in your practice, finding them. Maybe next time you sit down, pay attention to that. Look at letting go of the future, letting go of the past. Look at the moment when you let them go, when they disappear, when they are released and dissolve, and when you're ending up with present moment awareness again. And then look at when you're getting distracted, you get lost in thoughts again, and you have to do a few things to come back to the moment where you let go again. Letting go to me seems more like a very natural thing that actually happens as a result of cultivating properly. Uh, letting go necessarily cannot be anything that you can do. It's almost like the opposite of doing. There has to be a stopping, and that stopping happens as natural as the water that leaves the bottle when you unscrew the cap. Um, yeah, in the third stage, we are letting go of um, inner chatter, the, the constant monologue in our mind, or sometimes even dialogue, if we are particularly crazy. <laughs> like most of us, we're talking with ourselves and we're answering to ourselves. We're talking to ourselves and we're listening to ourselves. It's kind of a funny thing. Um, yeah, so th there is the end of that. And in order to come to the end of that, again, you have to direct your mind in very specific ways so that it, the result of that direction is a release. It's an end of that talking. Now, if you overdo that, if you overdo cultivating at any stage on the path, then uh, the chatter won't stop or you will end up like with a very kind of compressed and stressful kind of silence that that feels very much like hard work so it's not enjoyable so always maintain a good balance there you should be doing things in your meditation practice properly and then you should also that doing should always lead you to an end of doing to an end of stress and to an appreciation of what is going on right now in this moment. And really, I think even those people who say like meditation practice is solely about letting go, it's not about cultivating anything, um, they still cultivate. You know, we are still acting. The mind is constantly acting. And there are very coarse actions and there are very subtle actions. And there are very, very, very subtle actions. But to become sensitive to that is a lot of it's a lot of things in this path are about that because you become more and more sensitive how your actions, either whether they are gross or whether they're subtle, um, are actually creating suffering. And how gross actions create gross suffering and how very subtle actions create a very subtle sense of suffering and by letting go by detecting them by making the effort to detect them you can then release them and as you release them it is blissful it is nice it is pleasant it always works like that 
This is the beauty of me meditation. It's relatively simple mechanics. The difficulty is that we don't see many of the things that make us suffer in the beginning because our eyes are just not clear enough yet. But they are clearing up as we proceed, as we do it properly. So I, I just gave you an example of those three first stages. Uh, relaxing or releasing, settling the body, uh, the present moment awareness, and silent present moment awareness. Um, you can guess and see how that moves on throughout all the other stages, depending on where you are in your practice and what you're cultivating right now. But also you can see the same thing is true for life. There is a buildup of action, and that buildup of action, if it is skillful enough, always leads to release, letting go, always leads to pleasure, to calmness, to um, an appreciation of the here and now, back to presence. That Those are skillful actions. And uh, of course, when you're training the mind and you're also building qualities, specifically making them more powerful, like kindness, for example, or maybe the quality of gratitude and being satisfied with little, being a person that is easy to be with, you know, not with a lot of demands and a lot of, a lot of pains, but uh, a person that is very easy to be with, very, very nice to be with, that is happy with very little. Um, all that requires cultivation, you know, being patient, uh, being knowledgeable, being helpful and so forth. All these are great qualities and they are great qualities precisely because they create a life in which it becomes very easy to let go. And the more you let go, the happier you are, the more at ease you become. So it's very much dependent on our actions internally on the level of thought or mind as well as externally on the level of our body and our speech. How we act shapes our reality. And so if you shape your reality in a very good way, then it becomes very easy for you to go deep into letting go. Then you can experience the deeper states of, of meditation. You can experience the deeper states of cultivating the mind and the pleasure and bliss that comes with it can then begin to carry you and inform you and give you more creativity and uh, in turn then um, kind of condition your actions in such a way that they become really inspiring and nice and good in this world for, for yourself and other people around you as well. It's quite naturally that there's nothing forced. You're not trying to be a good person. You simply carry you're simply carrying a good state of mind, a released state of mind, uh, released from thoughts, released from time, at ease, pleasant, blissful in the here and now. The rest happens by itself. So um, this is all that comes to mind for today about the topic of releasing and cultivating I hope it was informative and useful for your practice. I hope you can bring that into your practice. I encourage all of you to try out what I'm talking about and see if, if this is true, if there are such two facets indeed, and if you can make use of them more wisely. Very often if we notice that there are such things as certain laws uh, in our practice and we become more sensitive to them, we can make better use of them and therefore progress faster. So I hope that is exactly what these talks are doing for you, helping you to progress faster in your practice. Um, yes, not just being another kind of information that comes your way and then gets forgotten later on. I think you, you all um, hopefully put that into practice. That would be great. And if you do have any questions, do let me know in the comment sections of these talks or simply in, in, you know, in a private message or by mail or something like that. I'm always open and happy to hear uh, from your stories and how that helps you and what you want to know. Yes, well, so I think for today that is enough. I wish all of you a wonderful weekend and look forward to see you or hear you all again next week. Until then, bye-bye.